Today, as we come to the table. Amy Carmichael, in this one particular poem she writes where she talks about, have you no scars? It's like, are there no scars in your heart and your life? If you don't have any scars, then, then you don't really understand the true love of the Lord. You don't really know what it means to walk with God. You really don't. And we don't seek that out. We don't want to be scarred. Who wants to be scarred? I don't. But the bottom line is when you're scarred for the Lord, it doesn't just leave a mark that is like, wow, I wish that wasn't there. It turns into a witness in your life and the world around you. Isn't that great? It's exciting. And so I want to encourage each of us, wear the scars of walking with Jesus as badges of witness and joy rather than torches of complaint. so good at complaining. If you think back over the last year and the decisions that have been made for you, like having to wear a mask or being forced to homeschool your children and work and worship from home so much of the time, we've gotten used to so many of these things. But even as restrictions lift, we easily find new sources of strife to fill our conversations and social media posts. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville, Our lives should look different as believers. As Pastor Mark will point out in today's message, it's not that we need to seek out suffering or persecution, but when it inevitably comes, we can face it with joy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 as he continues his message, A Godly Example. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you asking God to fill you with the Spirit? And secondly, do you know the Lord? Do you really know that you know Him? Because if you know the Lord, the joy is going to come. And even if it leaves, God will restore it when he's done doing in us what he wants to do. So it's something that, uh, you know, again, we need to be constantly asking God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, again, I want to just touch on the three different ways in the believer's life uh, that the Holy Spirit works and the three different purposes. Because I want you to understand, we're not going to go into an in-depth study of the Holy Spirit, but it it was because of the Holy Spirit they were experiencing joy. So I think there needs to be some level of understanding of how the Holy Spirit works so that if you're not experiencing that joy, especially now at a, at a less joyful time for many, you know how to receive that. And, and that is the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is with us and that is to lead us. It's a word that is para. It means to be alongside. He helps us and guides us. The second word that is used in the scripture about how the Holy Spirit works in our life, he is in us. It's the word E-N, in. Inside us, that happens at salvation when we give our life to the Lord. And the last one, and this is really where, again, the joy comes with, the, with him being in us, but really this is the one where I experience the greatest joy in my life, and that is he comes upon us for power and, and to fulfill the call. And that's the word epi, E-P-I, three different words in the Greek, three different ways that the Holy Spirit works. I'll give you a couple of examples of it in Scripture. In John 14, 16, and 17, Jesus used two of them. And notice he said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Note this, but you will know him, that is his followers, that's you guys, right? Those of us that believe, you will know him, for he dwells with you, there's the word para, okay, alongside, and he will be in you. Now, why did he say will be? Because remember, until Jesus died on the cross, he could not indwell anyone. The death on the cross allowed the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So prior to Jesus' death, there were only two ways the Spirit worked in a believer's life. It was with and upon. He was with us, and he came upon the Old Testament saints to give them power. The new thing that happened at Pentecost was not the upon. You know, we look at Pentecost, and God poured out his Spirit on the people there, and they began to speak in other languages and prophesy, and everybody was amazed there in Jerusalem. I think sometimes we look at that and think that was the new thing that God did. That was not the new thing. That had been done for thousands of years. That's what God did on a regular basis in the Old Testament. The new thing was when Jesus said to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. Because now the Holy Spirit came inside and was living inside of them. So here we see him with us and in us. 
Um, and while knowing this, you know, just simply knowing this does bring a measure of joy, I think the true joy and power comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And this is the one that you hear me emphasize from time to time because it's the one that changed my life the most. I, I was, the Lord was with me and I was saved probably about three months before the Spirit came upon me. And I was walking with the Lord to some degree. Um, I was involved in church already, but I didn't have any power. I had no, I had no ability to turn away from sin. I was still living, you know, I knew it was wrong, but I was still doing it. You know, you've been there, it's like, I know this is wrong, but I can't stop. And so I began to pray and say, God, I need to stop this. I know it's wrong, these things that I'm doing. I, I need some kind of power. And, and again, somebody shared with me, hey, did you know the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he'll give you power, it'll fill you with love and fill you with joy? And I'm like, I'm all in. How do I, where do I sign up, you know? And I remember getting alone in this house that I was house sitting for. I wasn't house sitting for the house. Um, it was a person, actually. I want to be specific on that in case I'm quoted. But either way, so I'm there in the house and I just said, Lord, I want everything you have for me. If there's some power that I don't have yet, God filled me with his spirit. It happened at that moment. He came upon me. My life changed radically. I was filled with joy. I was filled with love. And, and again, I had a new power in my life. I was able, I didn't suddenly become this super saint, you know, that was never sinning anymore, but now I had power to say no. And I noticed that used to, when the, the sin temptation would come, I couldn't say no. Now I was able to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And I had the power to do that. It's, it's, that's what that power is for. And so ask God to give you that power if you don't have it. It results in being a greater witness for the Lord. And it's why God told them to wait on that. Now, we don't wait on it now, so to speak. It was waiting until God poured out his spirit on the church when it was first born. Now we simply ask and trust and receive. And so he says, you became followers of us. You received the word in much affliction, joy of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse seven. So that you became examples. And again, that's the main thrust of what we're looking at tonight. You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Now, I wanted to couple both of those verses together because we're only covering those three verses tonight. But I wanted to couple those two together because they really give that, that whole picture here that I wanted to give of, of what Paul was trying to say. And notice he says, first, they're examples. And they had become examples to the people around them, even as Paul was an example to them. It's like, look, I passed that on to you. Now you're passing that on to others. And that's how it's supposed to work. You see, we set the example and we disciple other people and they follow suit. Now the word example here is so cool because the word example here, what it means is to leave a mark after being struck with a blow. Now to them, that may not have been cool when people were beating them for their faith, probably a reference to their persecution. The fact that some of them were being beaten, that some of them were being abused, not just verbally, but physically. But there's, there's kind of a double entendre here is what Paul is saying, because Paul says, not only do you have the marks of being beaten and that impression on you, but the impression made on you has made a mark on others. Your beating has made a, a seal of impression of godliness in other people's lives. So this kind of double thing going on that Paul's using here, which I think is wonderful, that is the mark or the imprint left after being struck with the blow of persecution. And this could be physically or non-physically. Some of you have been struck with the blow of persecution by family, by friends, etc. But the result of that is you become a witness and an example to both the church and the world around you. And Paul says here, it's a pattern, it's a template. It's almost like, you know, when you have like, you ladies that make your cake or you make your mold or do whatever, this kind of thing, you've got your mold, right? And you pour that in the mold and it comes out, you hope, looking like that mold if it comes out the right way or whatever. That's what it is. This is, he says, you, you've been beaten, but it was to God's glory and your glory because the scar that it made has now turned into the seal of God as a witness to others. And they look at you and go, why are you so abused? Why are you so beaten? Why do you have these scars of walking with Jesus, but you have joy? Where's the joy coming from? It's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus. And now you start sharing your testimony. See, this is, it's beautiful. Again, rather than being destroyed, and this is an encouragement for all of us. Note this, rather than being destroyed, they were simply branded with a scar of obedience. Isn't that beautiful? It's like, Lord, I'll take a scar of obedience. You know, I probably mentioned Amy Carmichael in this one particular poem she writes where she talks about, have you no scars? It's like, are there no scars in your heart and your life? If you don't have any scars, then, then you don't really understand the true love of the Lord. You don't really know what it means to walk with God. You really don't. And we don't seek that out. We don't want to be scarred. Who wants to be scarred? I don't. 
But the bottom line is when you're scarred for the Lord, it doesn't just leave a mark that is like, wow, I wish that wasn't there. It turns into a witness in your life and the world around you. Isn't that great? It's exciting. And so I want to encourage each of us, wear the scars of walking with Jesus as badges of witness and joy rather than torches of complaint. Boy, I wanted to talk. I was praying recently and I was just complaining to the Lord. I was like, rah, 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 rah. I mean, I, sometimes I, it, you know, don't ever hide anything in here to spy on me because you'll know everything about my life. I shouldn't have said that because now you'll do it. We'll find everything out. But I walk in here and I just pour everything out to the Lord. I do it. I like to walk and pray and I just talk to him. And I, I just recently, just complaining, complaining. And I, after about just 10 minutes, 15 minutes of complaining, I said, Lord, I'm just, this is, this is, what about just complaining to you all? I need to stop it. But I was like, but yeah, but the, the prophet said, you know, I pour out my complaint to the Lord, you know. So I start justifying myself. But, but God was really ministering to me. I don't know that God hears that. He hears our heart when we're being honest and pouring our heart out. God knows that. And, and yet I was thinking, what a, what a beautiful example we, we can use our difficult times as a badge of joy and as a witness rather than a torch of complaint and that whole shining forth of complaining before God. And why so? Listen, Jesus said, there's a great reminder for all of us. Matthew 5:11. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. It's not just a little glad, not just a little rejoicing, exceedingly for great. Here's why. Great is your reward. Great. For so, and, and not only is your reward great, look at the category you're in when you're persecuted and you take it the right way and use it for God's glory. For so the pers they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Isn't that great? You're in the category of a prophet. It's like, hey, I'm getting persecuted like Elijah did. I'm getting persecuted like Elisha did. And notice the two reasons that he gives her to rejoice. Number one, we have great reward waiting on us. But secondly, we have the honor to suffer with and for the Lord, just like the prophets of God. And notice it wasn't just certain individuals here that were a good example that Paul's talking about. This was a church-wide testimony. The, the whole church had a testimony. Look, I hope that all of your testimonies are good in the community. And if you mess up, and I've messed up, you can make that a better testimony. You can repent and, and start over and, and build that back. Sometimes it takes a while. But how wonderful it is to not only have individual testimonies like we have in here tonight, but for people to know Calvary Chapel has a testimony. You know, what does Calvary Chapel stand for? You know, people in this town, they do know what we stand for, believe it or not. I talk to people, and they say, yeah, you, you're the line-by-line, you're the line, verse-by-verse of the whole Bible. Group, right? Yeah, I'm glad people know that, because I want them to know that we're, our heart is the entire counsel of God's Word in this kind of thing. But I think it's important that people know who you are and what you stand for, and what Paul is saying to them, they know you in Thessalonica and in Macedonia and in Achaia and in all the other regions. They know you, and they know what you stand for. They know who you are, and you're a great witness. Wear it as a badge. You guys are doing great. Keep it up. And this is with no pastor. This is just you guys getting together, loving the Lord, and going for it. Beautiful. Again, the Holy Spirit is more than able to lead His church. But notice lastly there in, that, in, in uh, verse 7, they made them examples. They, they were made examples, receiving the word in the joy of the Spirit. And so it's when you hear the word, God's word, um, that's when the joy enters. And again, when the Spirit enters, the joy is, is brought to fruition and really blooms. And so again, he says, for you, you and notice this in verse 8, for from you the word of the Lord sounded forth. And again, he talks about not just Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place, and their faith has gone out, so he doesn't even need to say anything. Everywhere he goes, people have heard about how, how wonderful the church is in Thessalonica. And so Paul says, look, you shared not, God's word not only locally, but you're, you're just sounding it out, sounded forth. This word's very interesting, these two words. It speaks almost of a trumpet blast, or this is the one that really sticks in my mind, because I, I remember this, this it, it won't go, thunder rolls. You know when you hear the thunder clap and you hear it echoing off the hills and the mountains around you? That's what that word means. He's saying, your testimony and your witness is so strong in your region that it's like, boom, boom. it starts out loud and just keeps on going. And this is, I mean, what a great compliment to have. Your, rep your reputation precedes you, in other words, not just in Macedonia and Achaia. He says here in verse 8, but in every place. And what a great thing to be said about a church, that your reputation precedes you in every place, individually and as a whole. Now note this, this is so key to me because this was before the internet, this was before Facebook. This was before YouTube. This was before Twitter. This was before cool signage at the front of the road. I like the sign, you can tell. This was before radio. 
What he's saying is, the Holy Spirit needs none of that. The entire world, Paul said, was reached in his day without a radio, without Twitter, without Facebook, nothing online, no planes, no trains, nothing. The whole world, he says, was reached. Paul says, you've reached your whole region and you don't even have a, a, a streaming ministry. Sir. Look, when this happened, God's been using the streaming in a great way. I mean, it's amazing. It's not just us. It's happening to a lot of churches. The churches that are streaming, literally thousands of people. We've had thousands of people watching our services. We know that because it tells us on the computer. It's not because we're, it's because people are at home and they're looking for hope. They're looking for something. This is happening in other churches as well. It's not just here. So it's a great tool. Don't get me wrong. I praise God for the internet and all the people we can't, that we're reaching that we can't normally reach and that we're reaching tonight that we can't normally reach. I thank God for Facebook and for all these different things. My point is simply this. God doesn't need any of that. And if we think that, you know, that's got to be our main focus. Is those things are great tools to help us do ministry. But the power is in the teaching of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and then what you guys do. That's all they had in, Thessalon in Thessalonica. That was it. They heard the Word. They were filled with the Spirit. And they went out and they sounded for us. It echoed off the mountains and kept going in the whole region. He said, man, you guys are amazing. But it was the Holy Spirit doing it, doing it in them. So we need to be encouraged. It's amazing what God can do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know the largest growing church in the world right now has no internet ministry, no radio ministry, no Facebook ministry, no Twitter ministry, no social media ministry at all because it's illegal. It's the church of China. They're the largest growing church in the world, and all they have is all we need, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? So I love, don't, listen, I'm not attacking all these tools. I'm thankful for them, but I don't look to these tools for us to be able to reverberate throughout Knoxville and the region and around the world. I'm trusting in God's Holy Spirit to do what He's going to do. We're going to use these tools, but it's about the Lord, His Word, and the Spirit. That's what it's about. And so sounding forth again but notice this as well again they were so vocal in their faith that it that it was sounding forth in the entire region but notice this the reason it was sounding forth is they were vocal the whole sounding forth is a picture of vocalizing it's noise you're making noise in a good way but don't lose this you cannot be a good witness without vocalizing now i'm making you nervous right you mean i've got to share my faith you can't be a witness without sharing your faith with your mouth guys no, I'll just live in front of them. Look, you can be the nicest person in the world. They could have been the nicest people in the world in Thessalonica. Extremely nice, doing all kinds of good works. But they would not have sounded forth that testimony unless they vocalized the fact that Jesus Christ died for everyone in their region, loved them, and they needed to repent of their sin and, and enter the kingdom. We have to be vocal. And if there's ever a time we need to be vocal, it is now. The world's looking for answers. You know how I know that? Because a tiny little church in Knoxville has thousands of people watching every time we do this. So here's what that tells me. People are hungry. They want answers. They want to know what's going on. And so we need to be able to have answers. We need to be able to say, this is the answer. It's Jesus Christ. I'm convinced more than ever the time is so short for the Lord's return. We're going to talk a little bit about that next week. And I'm going to share some things, some really cool things. Some of you guys that have been listening to the signs of the times will be up on some of it. Some of it's new. You hadn't heard. But I mean, I think that things that are happening right now, we are so near the Lord's return. More than ever, we need to be about our Father's business. Listen, there's two things I want to encourage you guys. Make sure you're walking with God right now. This is not a time to be goofing off. There's never a time, but if there was never a time to really not be goofing off, it's right now because he could show up at any moment. And number two, this is our moment. This is it. You're on stage. Lights, camera, action. It's not about, well, you know, in a few years when the business gets better or in a few years when I do what This, you may not have a few years. You may not have a few years. It's, it's now is the time. And so I love the fact that God gives that urgency, but I think we see the urgency more than ever, even now. And again, I think, again, being a good example, as Paul's saying here, that's how people listen to us. If we're going to be vocal, we have to be that good example. So that's why Paul is driving home what a good example they are and the fact that we have to be that example. And again, I believe especially going on right now, we have to walk wisely and cautiously. I've had a lot of people say, well, why do we have to wear a mask? Why do we have to do social distancing? Here's the thing. And I know I'm, sure, I'm not going to go share on this long. I wrote the church a letter and I've made a public statement about it. But guys, our example, okay, there's a limit to everything. We know when it's time to say no, it's time to move on. We know that. And we'll all know when that is. 
But we need to be a good example to our governor, to our representatives, to our city. If we just ignore it and say, well, forget it, we don't care, what's that saying? That means just forget Romans 13, it doesn't exist. Who cares about Romans 13? Throw it out of the Bible, we're not gonna look at it. No, we're gonna look at Romans 13 because we teach all the Bible at Calvary Chapel. But we have to do it in the right context and in the right way. And so we have to be an example. Here's an opportunity for Calvary Chapel Knoxville to be an example to our community. And I believe that all of us, every church in Knoxville, we need to watch ourselves. What is our example and what example are we being? As I said, next week we'll get more into why I believe we're so close to the Lord's return as we finish chapter one. But again, I, I want to make sure uh, that we're ready today so that if something happens now, we don't miss it. You know, that we have our, have our heart ready to go. You know, here's the thing. The gospel is simple and, and basic, but it's powerful and eternal. And I know most of you in this room, some of you I don't recognize because you have a mask on. Kind of questionable. No, I'm just kidding. I understand that. But there are people watching right now, and there are people listening right now by radio, undoubtedly that don't know the Lord. And so I want to speak to them and you in here if you don't know the Lord, if I'm you know, deceived that someone really doesn't. But then I want us all to pray together for those watching and listening because I want our testimony to sound forth. You know, the Bible made it simple. The Bible just says, here's what happened. God created everything. Now, if we just all accepted that as a society, we'd be doing good. God created everything. And then what happened was mankind sinned. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. I had someone just the other day again, well, if God's a God of love, then why do we have so much death and murder and rape? and all? They don't understand the basic principle. God didn't make it that way. God made it good. God made it righteous. What happened was they fell in the garden, sin entered, and then all these bad things start happening. God didn't design those. They're a result and a consequence of man's sin. And so now what God said is, look at the mess they've made of things down there. I need to go rescue them. And the only way I can do that is become a man. So I'm going to put on human flesh. I'm going to go down there. And he walked among us by the name of Jesus Christ. That was God in human form. He went to the cross. He died on the cross. God requires blood to forgive sin. So he spilled his blood. Sin has now been forgiven, but here's the catch. And this is where I, I didn't understand when I was going to church and I was young and didn't know the Lord. My mindset was, well, he died for the sins of the world. I'm part of the world. He died for me. I'm in. It didn't work that way. Here's how it works. The Bible says he died for the sins of the world, but only those who accept it and receive it personally. So you've got to accept that he did it, and then you've got to say, I want that for me. I want that blood washing me, and so I'm going to receive that for myself. So you ask God to forgive you, and you receive the Lord, and you're born again. But now here's another catch. Again, there's, it's, the gospel's simple, but I think sometimes we miss it, so I want to emphasize a couple of things. There's also the confession to God of our sin, and there's repentance. Repentance. Now, what is repentance? You don't hear a lot about sin and repentance oftentimes, even in the church today, sadly. Now, a lot of churches do. I'm not saying, you know, we're the only ones that do that, but it's, it's getting less and less in a lot of churches because they don't want to turn people off. You know, they don't want to run people away or lose the crowd or whatever. But here's the bottom line. Repentance means you have to turn from what you're doing that is wrong. If you get a picture of, you know, facing this direction, you have to turn completely around and face the other direction and say, Lord, I'm going to confess my sin to you, but now I'm going to walk a different way. I'm going to follow you. And I believe that you died for me and that your blood's for me. That's the gospel. And just like that, another time at the table of God's word has come to an end. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of 1 Thessalonians, but you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series plus much more at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. The book of 1 Thessalonians mentions rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and in everything giving thanks. These are not always easy to do in a world that feels like it's been turned upside down. But with God's help and His Spirit residing in you, it's possible. Before we close, we want to know if you live in the Knoxville area. If so, we invite you to join Pastor Mark and the staff at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community and through this radio outreach. There's always a seat for you, Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15. We also meet on Sunday nights at 6 or Wednesday nights at 7. 
If you can't make it in person, that's not a problem. You can join us online. We're streaming our services through the Way Media app. You can download this from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. To find more info on Calvary Knoxville, scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church website. Pastor Mark has more to share from the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, so don't miss out on tuning into our next edition as we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.